Um, so, uh, Ahmed Alfi, or Alfi as he's affectionately known in the region, is probably one of the most experienced and uh, investors for a young man at the age 29. You look, uh, you look like you're fit as a fiddle. Rough road. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Alfi has been involved with a lot of investing in the region. Uh, Sawari Ventures is probably your primary uh, calling card, but uh, you've also been involved with Flat Six Labs. Uh, you've uh, helped put together, I guess, one of the more interesting uh, conferences in the region, which we're going to be going to in just a few more days in Cairo. Um, I guess maybe if you can start off by telling me how you got into uh, investing and uh, what makes you excited about investing in the region. Uh, well, how I got into investing, it was kind of almost in the Stone Age, but I'll, uh, <laughs> you were involved in getting brass exactly. and uh, yeah. you know, copper. Were, uh, no, investing in the region, really what attracted me to the MENA region is the spread between the talent and the resources they had to support them. Okay, There was so much talent and so little guidance and infrastructure around that talent to really get them to maturity and to help them build companies instead of projects or research projects or graduation projects or failed projects. And uh, that's where I kind of looked at it as a tremendous opportunity to make money and make a difference. And I, I know that you've uh, been in a market that has a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges, but you've probably been one of the most active investors uh, I think in a market that has you know several challenges, how how are you kind of viewing where things are at today uh, in Cairo, in Egypt, and what your role is there? So we, you try to ignore the political situation and keep going about your business, but it's almost impossible. Uh, I would say that the biggest impact of the political, let's say, roller coaster we've had over the last five years, is that too many entrepreneurs being passionate and very engaged people uh, get involved in politics and get distracted from their companies uh, and from running the business. Um, and the ones that survived the political upheaval as entrepreneurs were the ones that were older, that were in their 30s, early 40s, and were running the company at that time and stayed focused and were able to stay focused a lot better during the last four or five years. I think we've been investors in four or five companies in Egypt, and I know uh, Wazaf in particular was one that was built during a lot of the political changes that happened, and uh, you know, somewhat surprisingly and optimistically, has recently raised uh, Series A in the region. Um, what do you think is kind of behind uh, perseverance, I guess, in the uh, Egyptian entrepreneur? I think that you know, I'm, I've always been impressed seeing kind of what they've been able to accomplish in an environment where there isn't maybe a lot of capital and there is a lot of other uh, obstacles. Uh, I think it's, maybe you hit on something that I wanted to mention is, uh, one of the big mistakes we made early on in Flat Six is we actually accepted people based on uh, the ideas and the projects they brought instead of the passion and the desire. And we learned that we could teach them or improve their skills in everything but desire. So we ended up trying to figure out how to screen for desire. And we kind of took some ideas from some people. We took some ideas from Oasis 500. We took some ideas and we set up boot camps and we run people through drills that really test their commitment. Uh, so you don't get people that have been, uh, let's say, hypnotized by the glamor of being an entrepreneur without having the requisite uh, passion and you know ability to really stay the course because as any entrepreneur knows you know you have some serious ups and downs in the you know along the way I, I think to maybe characterize that in the opposite environment in the US now I think becoming an entrepreneur or doing a startup has become so sexy that uh, young men are more likely to do a startup than they are to start a band for purposes of perhaps uh, getting a date on a Friday night. Um, the exact opposite might be said in Egypt, where I think you have such a crucible, uh, really such a set of challenges, that the only folks that are doing startups are really people who are passionate entrepreneurs, or at least they're you know, more focused on trying to build those businesses given all the other challenges. Can you tell us a little bit about Flat Six and what that structure looks like? Um, I guess in addition to Sawari, you, you do the accelerator model, correct? 
So uh, Flat6 has the first accelerator in Cairo, and we've, uh, we've decided to expand regionally uh, to take kind of the Flat6 structure to different markets with local partners. And the key component is the local partners. And uh, then, How many do you have operating well, we now? We, curr we currently have three, uh, Cairo, Jeddah, Abu Dhabi. We're hoping that in 2016, we're looking at five different markets right now. Okay. Um, five maybe five additional markets to the three. Uh, additional markets to the three and maybe a second one in Cairo. And uh, we'll see about other countries. And you know, as two have mentioned, plenty of opportunities in Saudi. Uh, there's some great talent there and a the big population. Um, and hoping that in 2017 we'll think about uh, expanding into sub-Saharan Africa. So I get, think given the last panel's perspectives on Accelerator, uh, why are you doing all these accelerators if they're all losing money? Doesn't that mean you're just going to lose money in more locations? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I would, it's actually very interesting because that view, um, kind of, we, we look at it, the, the accelerators are a portfolio. We have several of them, but I think that they will, uh, they'll all make money. I would say if you look right now on the total capital invested, including admin costs, we probably have something over a 25% IRR based on third-party valuations. So it's not, not based on our re-upping on the companies. Okay. That sounds like a pretty good return on investment to me if you're making 25%. Well, you get a you get a double bank because you also wind up with the development aspect that was mentioned in the previous panel that Yusuf mentioned and that uh, Tu mentioned that uh, you're improving the community. And I have to say, the accelerator is a unique is a unique animal in that it acts as a magnet for the community. It really activates the community. And in each one of our accelerators, we have a dedicated person who's a community manager and their sole job is to activate the community, to bring the academic institutions, all the NGOs, the angel investors, everybody that wants to be involved and uh, to build the ecosystem around the accelerator. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think, you know, we probably similarly to you folks run both a seed program and an accelerator program. and. In a lot of ways, when we first started the accelerator program, we weren't sure we were going to make money with it, uh, and the overhead costs were high, but we felt like the offsetting value of drawing in community and creating brand value was going to give us great investment opportunities down the road. I just want to add a comment because, you know, congratulations, good luck with the fund here. Thank you. And I would tell you that accelerators and VCs are probably the only businesses that like competition. Okay? Because the Especially more... Especially in this region, we need more help. <laughs> absolutely. Nothing bad can happen if you have more VCs and more accelerators at this stage of the development of our community. So I think it's fantastic, and I'm very excited that you're going to be more active in the region. Great. We hope to be investing in more flat six uh, companies and with Sawari. Um, I guess what's we've heard a lot of opinions today about what is the MENA region and what companies, countries, excuse me, are the most exciting. Uh, I think at least one person today had mentioned that Egypt was, you know, one of the most exciting areas to be investing, or at least that that was growing. Uh, what do you consider the MENA region, and where are you most excited about uh, putting new accelerators or investments? Uh, well, the the MENA region, Morocco to the GCC. But uh, the areas, we're very excited about different ones for different aspects. Uh, Egypt just has so much talent, okay? I would just, you know, rough estimate, Egypt probably has 50% of the tech talent in the region, right? Or in the Arab world. Uh, however, there are advantages and opportunities in different countries. Uh, Saudi is a great market. Uh, our experience in Abu Dhabi, as Isa mentioned, it's amazing how many, we had applications from 50 countries for the accelerator. It's amazing that the talent is relocating because the government and uh, 2454 really have set a, um, a place where people can work, where it's attractive to them. So the regulatory environment is really very important. If the regulatory environment in Egypt was better and it didn't take 15 or 20 steps to set up a company, you'd probably see more talent and at least more leadership talent coming from the outside to set up their companies in Egypt. Because there's the talent, you can hire the developers and get numbers that you couldn't get in other places at reasonable cost. Um, you know, given those challenges, what do you feel are investment categories or trends that are a good fit 
for Mina? Which ones do you think are not maybe such a good fit? Um, I think it's going to be difficult to to start into some of the things that are more mature, like e-commerce. Okay. okay, if you're going to start now, I think unless you're finding a really nice niche and you're going to figure out how to slice something off of somebody, uh, I think we're way behind in fintech, way behind in content. Uh, I still think there's a lot of room for innovation and for development. I think our companies have fought somewhere around 17, 18 patents in the U.S. and more than half have been granted. We haven't had any denied so far. So uh, this is like, you know, pushing the edge and things that are slightly ahead of their time, but they will be very relevant. They're filing patents and gradually working on companies that if they were in the U.S. would be getting 20 to $50 million raises just on the patents that they have. However, being in the Middle East, we don't have that kind of speculative money that's really you know, looking for the big home runs right now. So I'm guessing you have to be a little bit more focused on not so much capital intensive businesses and ones that generate revenue sooner in the life cycle? Definitely, or that can uh, pursue their business plan with a slightly lower you know, raise because very few companies are gonna raise a $20 million round and a $50 million round in the MENA region in tech. I'm hoping that's going to change in the next three to five years. And I'm optimistic because I'm seeing more and more uh, investors outside the region coming in. But I think we're going to need one or two big exits. And I'm hoping that some of the companies that raise some big rounds really end up hitting home runs. We really need them to. Um, you mentioned maybe uh, trying to figure out where capital is going to be coming from. Where do you think the most need is in the ecosystem right now? I think we've, we've seen seed funds start to come into the market. Uh, accelerators, obviously, you're involved with. Uh, but what about maybe the rest of the angel network and the other VCs? Where, where is kind of the capital most needed in the market as far as you're concerned? I would say that uh, just Series A. I don't think we have enough Series A money in the region. And the companies that get beyond Series A and get traction uh, and start getting revenues, they can get debt. Um, it doesn't really work very well in the Western model of a tech company. However, uh, you have to get to a certain... Uh, SME in Egypt is a $20, $25 million company, right? That's, it's, it's a little big for a startup in the Middle East. So uh, I'm hoping that we'll get to fill that gap, but just... I can't really tell you three years out where the real gap is going to be because the ecosystem here is going to be different, right? It's not going to be, you can't take the same metrics that you have in, you know, in Silicon Valley. And the most important aspect we need to do is just keep looking at where the gaps are and plugging that because the key that we want to get to is an ecosystem, which by definition is self-sustainable. Do, do you feel like there's a role for corporate and government to play while the rest of that ecosystem is being built? Are they, are they helpful actors in filling in some of those gaps? There's definitely a role, but they and I disagree on what the role is. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, there, there's a lot they can contribute, right? The problem is their contribution comes at a different uh, timeline than the need. Right. Their decision-making processes are different, and uh, I find that s startups that base their business plan on a contract with a big company in the MENA region are in for a bad surprise because the big companies go on such a different timeline than the need of the startups. Yeah, and I have seen some, you know, trail of tears there myself in uh, companies, startups dancing with what we call elephants that occasionally step on, step on them. And uh, many companies, I think, can die waiting for those contracts to come into place. Um, what about family offices and other sort of high net worth individuals? Obviously, there's a lot of capital in the region. Uh, are they helpful actors in place of Series A? So uh, definitely. However, most family offices are run by professionals who don't know anything about startups and who don't know anything about VCs. They have, they're run by professional managers, former bankers, former PE guys or girls. And what we need to do really is reach out to uh, most family offices where somebody built the wealth, somebody expanded it, and now everybody expecting the third generation to blow it. Well, the third generation is not blowing it because they're all pretty well educated and they're pretty smart people. However, those are the guys that are not involved in running the family offices yet, but those are the guys that have the resources to make investments. And I would say it's incumbent on all of us to really engage them and educate them and bring them into the community. Those 
that third layer is a massive hidden opportunity in the family offices. I think you have a pretty good grasp of what's going on in the region. You're active in Egypt, you're active in other areas. Um, are you seeing a lot of Egyptian entrepreneurs look to places like uh, Dubai and Riyadh, uh, maybe even Istanbul and other parts of the region for their customers? Or are they mainly staying focused on Egypt? Oh no, def definitely looking outside the borders. Um, we should get, I mean, you know, uh, our friend Fadi has been screaming about this for years. We definitely need uh, some kind of open borders, at least on electronic business, uh, at least on tech. All right. So somehow we need to find a way to get uh, these countries to really allow companies to do business in, a, you know, in an easier way. It's almost impossible for an Egyptian company to really do business effectively in Saudi without being there and having to set up office and incur all the big capex. Do you feel like there's a European model that can exist across the region? I mean, you already have the GCC, but is there a way that, you know, the Levant and North Africa can be incorporated into that economy? Sadly, no. I don't think that that's <laughs> on the horizon, at least in my lifetime. I don't see that one coming. Uh, too many political differences, too many demographic differences. Uh, however, I do see other, I mean, it's very reasonable to expect a North Africa trade union among the four or five countries in North Africa that can get that to work with each other. Maybe just looking at that then, I mean, there's definitely some large populations in North Africa and even a little further south. There's, uh, you know, maybe not as high on the economic per capita sort of, uh, but certainly a lot of potential people. Uh, is that something you think is possible in the next five to 10 years? 10 maybe because I think they all need it and it wouldn't be threatening to any of them. Great. Um, any last comments? I think, I think, you know, again, I'm always impressed by how much work you're doing in Cairo, uh, in Egypt, and now spreading around the rest of the region. Uh, what do you think are exciting opportunities that are happening in the next few years and what keeps you, uh, what keeps you waking up in the morning? Uh, education is really the... Ex Sorry, education is the exciting thing to work on, not to make money right now. I'm, uh, we're working on education, but I really think there's a tremendous opportunity in giving people the access to entrepreneurial skills without encouraging them to be entrepreneurs, because those skills are what'll help them get into the job market. And uh, I really, I mean, it's one of the projects that I'm gonna start working on next year is putting together some online content that's free to the Arab world, explaining sales skills, common business sense, innovation, how to think outside the box uh, on a business sense, not uh, you know social sense. So we'll try to stay away from all the controversial stuff so we can get stuff done. Uh, maybe just to wrap up, could you give us a preview of what we're likely to see at Rise Up? And uh, are you excited about uh, hosting one of the largest conferences in the region? So. <clears throat> uh, Rise Up is unique. It's uh, just to be clear. Rise Up is a group. It's a company that happens to be a tenant at our campus. This is their function as they organize this conference. We actually host the conference. We, I don't do anything other than fix up the facilities and the security and everything else. There's an amazing team that just does a phenomenal job on Rise Up, and so I just want to make sure we, we don't get the credit for that. They, the four of them, are just fantastic, and they're planning to do more and more events. Uh, I think it'll be the greatest startup conference and entrepreneurial conference in, in the region. Expecting about 4,000 people this year, over 100 speakers from all over the world. Uh, it's a great place to network. It's a giant celebration. Uh, again, but the first celebration of entrepreneurship out of you, the 2010 that uh, uh, Fadi Gandur and Arif and Abraj and Wamda put together was just this will be something similar to that. The first one three years ago was 1,500 people. Last year was 2,500 people, expecting close to 4,000 this year. And uh, if anybody hasn't signed up and they've probably stopped selling tickets, call me because we'd love to have all of you there. It's amazing. Thanks very much, Alfie. Really uh, excited to have you as a partner in the region and looking forward to coming to Cairo next week. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Dave. And welcome to Egypt. Thank you.